In the heart of the Hamus Forest, ruins of an ancient village lay slumbering beneath the soil. Archaeological excavation took place here nearly 100 years ago. Standing atop the site today, the ruins leave a footprint of Rumlock mounds and Kiva depressions, covered in grass, cactus, and trees. Artifacts scatter the surface, providing us insight into daily village life prior to the Spanish colonial period. Join me today as we explore the history of Anshagi Pueblo. Volcanic activity in the Hamas province began in the early to middle Pliocene, with successive eruptions creating geology of basalt, andesite, quartz latite, and rhyolite. This culminated in events 1.4 million years ago, which formed the Valle Calderas, depositing a layer of ash which created portions of the Bandelier Tuff Formation, covering an area of 400 square miles. The region is drained by the Hamas River and its principal tributaries of the East Fork, Rio Guadalupe, and Vallecitos Creek. Numerous hot and warm springs dot the area, which receives 10 to 25 inches of annual precipitation, much of which occurs as intense summer thunderstorms and winter snow. The average growing season varies from 120 to 160 days with extreme temperature fluctuations. The first evidence of sedentary inhabitants in the Hamas province indicates arrival around 1250 AD or slightly earlier. Source of immigration has long been a matter of conjecture. A proposed scenario of Hamas migration is that prehistory begins and develops in the upper San Juan River area until about 950 AD, when some of these people moved into Guyana country. By 1250, these people then arrived and settled in the Hamas Springs area. The earliest tree ring dates from a habitation structure are from a series of rooms in a rock shelter on the east fork of the Hamas River, with a single cut date of 1247 AD. By 1300, the Hamas occupied numerous medium to large sized pueblos, both in drainages of the area and high up on the mesa tops. In between the villages, there are many one to four room field houses, seasonally inhabited and associated with agriculture. Between 1928 and 1934, a series of excavations occurred at Anshagi as joint field schools between the School of American Research and University of New Mexico. In 1938, Professor of Anthropology Paul Ryder published a two-volume report on the site. Approximately two-thirds of the village, consisting of 101 rooms, was excavated and recorded. After excavation in the 1930s, the site was then backfilled with dirt to preserve the pueblo underneath. Today, the ruins appear as mounds of room blocks and kiva depressions, covered in grass, cactus, and trees. A paved road is adjacent to the site, and power lines run through it. Anshagi sits on a bench above a permanent stream at about 6,700 feet in elevation. The location is in a ponderosa pine forest with pinon, oak, and juniper. Floodplains of the stream and terraces above could potentially be farmed. Notice the many cactus growing densely here. Prickly pear and choya tend to proliferate on disturbed soil and could be a useful diagnostic of potential sites, such as this one. Several plant communities define the Hamas province, including mixed conifer forests of pine, fir, spruce, and juniper. Large mammals such as deer, elk, and bear are still common today, and were probably an important food sources at the village. In fact, I found many examples of mule deer scat right here at the site.
Anshagi translates to juniper growing place from the Toa language, which is quite appropriate given the numerous juniper I found still growing here. The Pueblo consisted of several room blocks enclosing a square plaza. Anshagi had almost 300 rooms, with portions reaching three stories high. Three kivas, detached rooms, and several midden areas were found at the site, and also excavated under Paul Ryder. The village was constructed of unshaped, uncoursed masonry, using ample amounts of mortar, wedges, and spalls. Walls were built primarily from sedimentary stone, including flow breccia and sandstone. The exterior walls of the Pueblo had no opening, making entry only accessible by ladders and then through openings in the roof. Room features include bins, vents, fire pits, deflectors and benches, small crypts or cavities in the walls, post holes, and subfloor cysts. One of these cysts was jar-shaped, five feet deep, with an opening in the floor two feet across. Upon excavation, the cyst was found to be filled with large, damp boulders, and Ryder believed it was used to store water, having a 145-gallon capacity. Similar features have also been uncovered in the Guyana region. Tree ring dates indicate construction of Anshagi began in the late 1300s to early 1400s, continuing into the 1500s. The Pueblo was probably occupied until around 1627 AD. Perhaps the remaining population then left and joined nearby Pueblos such as Gisawa. Anshagi had three kivas, semi-subterranean rooms used by Pueblo people for ceremonial and religious purposes. Kiva A was the most elaborate, in which the ventilator was positioned to the east. It was oval in shape, with a depth of eight feet. The altar had been extensively modified, enclosing two fire pits. The rectangular ventilator opening was about one and a half by two feet, and emerged from the wall six inches above the floor. Its shaft was circular, roughly two feet in diameter. Two presumed post holes were found, as were lines of smaller holes, five on one side and six on the other, which could have been used to anchor looms for weaving. The two other kivas had ventilators facing south. Kiva B had a three-sided altar, partially enclosing the fire pit. Interestingly, this was the only kiva to have a sipapu. The symbolic navel acting as umbilical cord connecting to our mother earth. It was eight inches deep, lined with small flat rocks. A subfloor crypt was also observed, lined with rough stones and filled with considerable amounts of ash and charcoal. No post or loom holes were observed here, however 17 matates in various stages of wear were found in the fill of Kiva B. Finally, Kiva C was 15 feet in diameter. The only features observed here were that of a small altar with some flagstone paving on the east side. Three room classifications were designated by Ryder during excavations at Anshagi. 45 class A rooms were identified, which had no floor or wall features other than plaster and were most likely used for storage. Class B rooms all had plastered walls with one or more floor features or secondary structure. 36 of these were excavated and were the most variable room type. The diagnostic feature for class C rooms was presence of a deflector, though all examples of this class had other features, such as bins, vents, fire pits, and benches. 20 of these rooms were excavated, 16 of which had two bins, one vent, and one deflector. This configuration first led Ryder to suggest a relationship between the Hamas and Guyana sites. Symmetrically paired bins with deflector, vent, and fire pit closely resemble the features of stereotypical Guyana surface and pit houses, with such formalized arrangements not found elsewhere in the southwest. Exploring the site, I found a well-worn grinding stone to the north. This would have probably been used for food processing, to turn corn and pinyon nuts into meal. A few obsidian pieces were also observed, one perhaps worked into a point or scraper.
Numerous pot shards scattered the surface of Unshagi. I primarily found black utility ware, used for culinary purposes, and heavily weathered painted pieces, which are the Hamus black on white ceramics. To those who work in the Hamus area, do you notice that the white slip disintegrates faster than other black on white pottery types from surrounding Pueblo sites? Over time, there was a gradual transition from indented corrugated to plain smooth surface ceramics here. Latest levels at Unshagi exhibit almost no corrugation. Along with this transition was a shift in temper type from primarily tough to vitreous andesite. Many of the shards exhibit a rough exterior with pitting. Prior to the Pueblo Revolt of 1680, Hamus black on white pottery was ubiquitous and remained remarkably consistent for over 300 years. Black on white ceramics are characterized by a thick white slip and organic matte paint ranging from deep black to brown and almost exclusively tempered with rhyolithic tuff. Inception of the style began from 1300 to 1375, but the first secure dates come from here at Anshagi, around 1400 AD. Black on white dominates the ceramic assemblage of every large pueblo in the Jemez province from 1350 to the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. Ceramics helped to illustrate the radical cultural shift that happened after the Pueblo Revolt. Comparison of pottery pieces from Revolt-era pueblos like Pataqua and Balatsaqua with Gisua and Anshagi provides us a stark example, where Hamas black on white pot shards comprise over 40% of total assemblage in these pre-revolt pueblos, contrasting with Pueblo components built after the revolt, where black and white pottery prevalence drops to less than 2% of the total assemblage. Average room size of pre-colonial Jemez Pueblos, like Anshagi, are smaller than those built during the Spanish colonial era. Comparison of average floor area illustrates this disparity. Rooms constructed after the Pueblo Revolt were notably larger and exhibit a considerably greater range of variation than those of the pre-colonial era. This conclusion is drawn from CAD measurements of 99 rooms at Anshagi compared to 65 rooms in the most recent component at Balitsequa. The larger room size may index an aspect of Pueblo resistance to Spanish colonization that had a significant impact on Jemez social organization. In early 17th century, Spaniards levied exorbitant taxes on the Pueblos of New Mexico on a household-by-household -household basis, regardless of the number of family members living under one roof. From colonial accounts, described by Father Alonso de Benavides, it has been established by the first governors of New Mexico and is being continued by order of the Viceroy that each house pay a tribute consisting of a cotton blanket the best of which are about a yard and a half square, and a fanega of corn. This is understood to be for each house and not each Indian, even though many Indian families live in such houses. It often happens that the Pueblos increase or decrease in houses, or if one tumbles down, its dwellers move to that of their relative, and none of these pay tribute except for the house in which they live. In an attempt to subvert colonial taxation, Pueblo families consolidated households, combining more people under fewer roofs. Over time, this appears to have resulted in construction of larger rooms to accommodate the increased number of people living in each structure. Introduction of metal axes, draft animals, and wagons also resulted in cutting and transport of larger trees for vigas, producing larger rooms in colonial pueblos than in their pre-Spanish predecessors, such as here at Anshagi. Tribute regulations were then reassessed in 1643 as a result of declining Pueblo population and the burden of encomienda, then shifting from household to individual. Despite this, the impact on Pueblo social organization was lasting and the Jemez continued to utilize larger rooms into the late 17th century at Balitsequa and elsewhere. Anshagi gives us valuable insight into one of the first villages built by Toa people prior to Spanish colonial influence. The 1930s excavation and later publication still remain the most thorough record of investigation 
into Jemez Pueblo archaeology. As always, visit these sites with respect. Take nothing and leave nothing. If you have found this video insightful, please like and subscribe to the channel to join me on our next adventure.